Okay, I'd like to welcome everybody back, Alabama Care. Today we are in Birmingham, Alabama at uh, UAB. And we have Dr. Julie Prescott. And Dr. Prescott is an Associate Professor of Healthcare Organization and Policy at the UAB School of Public Health. And today we're gonna be talking about evaluating the effectiveness of programs providing services to people with disabilities. And at this point, I'd like to hand it over, Dr. Prescott, if you would introduce yourself. Well, hi there. So uh, I'm Julie Prescott, uh, as you just heard, Associate Professor, and I am really delighted to be here today and spend some time with you all, talk about something that's near and dear to my heart. Well, we appreciate you giving us the morning here, and we always like to ask, are you, are you originally from Alabama? I am. I am actually born and raised right here, uh, just about an hour away. I'm from Gadsden. Very so. cool. Uh, and the follow-up to that is, is it Roll Tide or War Eagle? Oh, gosh, it's Go Blazers. Okay. <laughs> kind of the middle ground there. UAB. Come on, Go Blazers. Uh, my brother is actually a coach at UAB for football, uh, and so I know their football program has really started to ramp up in the in the last few years. Absolutely. Uh, We've got a winning team. A yeah. Great coach, great program, and a new stadium coming. So. The stadium's huge. It's over there by Topgolf. It is. So if you go to Topgolf, you can kind of see the construction. Right. It, right. It looks amazing over there. Super excited for that. Yeah. So. Okay. Uh, well, today we're going to be talking, like, like we said, about providing the effectiveness of programs. But before we get into that, I'd like to talk a little bit about your background and some education history. Sure, sure. So, um, gosh, I'm one of those folks, probably like many folks who are listening in today or watching today, that um, you had some plans and thought you might be going one way and you end up somewhere entirely different and have enjoyed the ride. Um, so I originally knew that I wanted to go into the medical field and was interested in, in really the only thing I knew about was to be a, a physician, a medical physician, and pursued that in my undergraduate studies. Uh, went to Birmingham Southern College, so right here, local um, fantastic school, and learned so much there about the, the wider world. Um, but actually realized that medical school was probably not the right path. I was really interested in the relationships that are built between um, children and families and medical providers. And so found my way into occupational therapy. So I'm an occupational therapist first, have graduate degrees in that. Um, and then um, through an, another lucky, somewhat happenstance, but really I think just having excellent mentors around me, I uh, found myself into public health. So I also have a, a graduate degree, a master's in public health or an MPH right here at UAB. And that's in maternal and child health. And then my PhD is from Auburn University. So I um, have to have a, a little nod there for Auburn. And um, that is in public administration and public policy. So definitely have had a little bit of a path um, and find myself going from direct services uh, all the way into now in an academic setting so that is quite the resume <laughs> i do have to say um, i'd like to ask a few questions on the occupational therapist and sure. uh, were you working kind of one-on-one -on -one with uh, children i was or? um that's the, the really the one thing that stayed consistent for me from from the time i could really think about what you want to be when you grow up is that i wanted to work with children um, and so I have always worked with children. Uh, I worked my first job, my first real big girl job was right across the way here at Children's of Alabama. Um, started in inpatient rehabilitation kind of type caseload and then found myself um, more interested in some of the outpatient and community-based work. So spent time doing that and then eventually in the um, Alabama's early intervention system. So doing early intervention program uh, home visits for um, children birth to three in our state. Um, and what age were those were those children that you were interacting with and working with? Sure, sure. So, well, with that that program, the early intervention program, it's it's you know birth to three. But really, um, in my outpatient work, it was a bit broader um, mm -hmm. than that. Uh, but definitely, my specialty area were, would be younger infants, children, very medically fragile. Um, young children and infants and their families. So, kind of birth to three yeah, right there. Yeah, really birth to three, but I certainly worked with older um, children and youth as well. Is there a uh, success story without naming any names that really comes to mind when you think about your work there? Oh, wow. Gosh. Is there's, there, there's the one that really sticks out <laughs> to you like, oh, we had a great you know, example here. You know, there, there's so many of those kinds of stories. And, and I really think that um, there's something to be learned and celebrated for everyone that you work with and every family. And it really is seeing, um, I think, the joy that children and, and parents have as they connect and learn new skills and really um, as parents learn to feel more comfortable 
um, describing, discussing, and, and really advocating for their children. So I don't know that I could give a, a one success story other than that, of that every time you see that kind of connection happens, it, you, you know that you, you, you're in the right place. Well, I'm sure there's some parents and families that remember your name because uh, at that point, you know, they need a lot of support uh, as a family, as a whole structure there uh, to be able to help their child and, and help the parents as well. So. Well, um, you're, I think you're right about that. I, I, and I will say, um, being a therapist and um, to see that, that look of trust in a parent's eyes when they hand you their infant um, and really have questions. And, and I think the, the nice thing about being a pediatric therapist, whether you're a physical therapist, occupational therapist, or, or speech therapist, is that with children, you, you understand that they're not in a vacuum, right? So their, their parents are the constant in their lives. So mm. whatever that parent looks like, is it a you know, caregiver, a grandmother, a foster parent, whatever family means to that, to that child, um, if the family's not successful, the child can't be. So um, the therapeutic relationship is really special when you work with children because you do have the family component and um, having them be, I mean, they are the integral piece mm -hmm. of that relationship. Yeah, they're the, they're the people, the rock that's going to be there 24 hours a day. And I was having a conversation with somebody the other day that we were talking about, you know, they have a son or daughter that's in uh, the school system and making sure they're in communication with their teachers. So sure. the same rewards, rewards that are going on in school can be, you know, the same at home. So it's a continuum of, uh, so that the child has a, a very easy you know, transition there from the school to home. Right, absolutely. Um, it really doesn't matter if children can be successful in a therapy gym. For, yeah. Uh, and if they can't be successful at home and their parents or caregivers can't um, replicate those kinds of successes, then, you know, you really haven't done the, the entirety of your job. I, I imagine it's a lot of coaching the parents too, uh, of how to support and... Right, I think it is, and I think through my career and the different um, experiences, I think coach is a maybe overused word, but it sure is the right one for that. So whether you're um, working with children or parents, and, and as you move through in, in education and, and actually become a teacher in some of my more recent, uh, and even mentoring younger folks and junior colleagues even, um, I think coach is absolutely the right word. Mm -hmm. um, I like the word. You know, it kind of fits a lot of different situations there. I've had a lot of coaches in sports and, and in life. so I certainly have as well. And, and I wouldn't be sitting here if it weren't for those coaches and um, other mentors, which I guess is, can be one and the same. So I've had lots of folks who've helped me get where I am today. So you're an occupational therapist at Children's Rehab right across the street here in Birmingham. Um, what made you want to continue your education into the Masters of Public Health? Right. Well, I was a, a practicing therapist, as I mentioned, at Children's of Alabama, and um, I really got interested in systems issues. I didn't, I know people say that word a lot, and what does system mean? And, and But if you think about um, at that point in, in my life, I was working exclusively either in a therapy clinic or in a hospital, and then certainly in, in family homes as well in the early intervention program. But I really worked with um, extremely low birth weight infants, Often, I was a developmental therapist in the high-risk follow-up clinic here at UAB. So, um, primarily, when I started, these were were infants and their families, um, and it, the infants were less than two pounds two ounces at birth. Mm. Um, so they had uh, certainly were at risk for developmental delay and, and other types of disability or or health needs. Um, and so, I in those settings, I realized how important there were, besides just the medical issues, mm -hmm. how important some of the social and ecological and environmental issues were. And I got really interested in seeing a lot of the same things over and over and recognizing that things worked out really well for some folks and not so well for others. And it wasn't obvious to me why. Um, and so luckily, again, I had these really wonderful mentors around me who had already walked the path of public health. They, they knew what public health was and and that they said, gosh, you're speaking public health language. And I didn't know what that was. I had no idea um, what public, I mean, I knew they inspected restaurants and I knew you could go there and get shots if, if you needed it, but I had no idea that the breadth and what the world of public health is and you know, thinking about more population-based um, interventions and really creating conditions or preventing, but also creating conditions in which people can be successful and healthy and well. And so that's what happened. A mentor said, go across the street, go talk to the folks in public health. Yeah. And um, so that's what I did. I, I, I consider myself a lifelong learner. Um, and I, I, you heard my degree <laughs> history, which was a little bit by accident, of course, but um, I like to learn. So I found myself in you know, furthering my education to add this, this layer of public health. 
training. When you go through that, it kind of makes me think that, you know, you're helping this family or helping these select few families, but you have this urge uh, to kind of help a bigger audience there in the system's way. Uh, to be able to, you know, have a positive impact on, on a larger audience there uh, through the systems. And you mentioned systems issues, systems issues get thrown around a little bit. Um, I almost think of it and tell me if I'm wrong here, but these are things that are disability independent that have an effect on the outcome and the success there. Absolutely. Absolutely. If you think about all the things that, that bring you to where you are today and all the the different um, programs and even the policies that are in our our state and our nation that, that impact what you do every day, what you can do, what you can't do. Um, and those, you're absolutely right. That that idea of a systems or broader um, piece, I mean, disability is, is a part of that, but um, it's certainly broader than that as well. Mm -hmm. um, now looking back, um, you said at the time you were noticing that some families would, su would succeed and some wouldn't. And there's a lot of different factors there. Having years in the industry now, is there one factor that you can really point to or, or a couple that you say you really need to hone in on these for success? Right. Um, well, we know that there are, you know, certainly you, you hear the word health equity these days. Um, you, there's other types of equity if you think about educational equity. Um, and one of the things that we do in public health is we want to, to have a healthier world, right? And um, what we know is that health disparities are, are just rampant. I mean, there's differences in life expectancy, infant mortality, um, and all those, they vary by race, by ethnicity, um, certainly by age, uh, they vary by income status. And often in our um, world here, we, we say a lot that it, your, your zip code may matter more for your health and outcome than your actual genetic code. And so, you know, when you think about things like education and income and employment, those are really important factors. And, um, you know, I think education is such an important, and it doesn't always have to be formal education. Um, there are certainly ways for internships and um, doesn't have to be one of those four year or 10 year or 12 year degrees, right? They're technical programs, but really just having a good solid education so that all children read on grade level, that they graduate and they go on to be able to have jobs and fulfill life and then raise the next generation of young folks who, so, right. That's kind of the compounding interest there. If you can make it a positive impact today, you know, what does that look like in a hundred years? Um, you know, plant the trees so your kids can sit in the shade. You're right. You're right. You're right. We, we talk about how important that is. If you think about a life course and, and we think about our own life course that we start as, you know, a little, um, when our moms are pregnant and then those little nine months, hopefully that you have there and through a childhood and then eventually on through adulthood and, and older adulthood. But in reality, everything that you do today, you're actually paying forward to the next generation. So, so much of who I am has to do with who my mom was and who my family was and who my grandparents were. And then same thing going forward. So um, it's a big responsibility when you think about it, that it's not just about you and where you are today, but all that will come beyond. So. Yeah, you gotta get off the couch. All your ancestors are saying, hey, you gotta go. <laughs> you gotta do something. Your kids are gonna want that. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and I like how you said the zip code. I saw a tweet the other day that was um, something like they, they're going to have this blood work test or something where they can uh, measure the probability of you graduating and getting a high paying job. And the, the reply to that was they already have that. It's called your zip code. Absolutely. Um, so that's right. a big, big point there. Yeah. And, you know, we it's really staggering when you think about it. And because some of those things are, are um, based on history and then some of it's just happenstance and where you are. And um, that, that's a hard thing to, to we, ha we have to talk about it. We have to recognize it so that we can uh, begin to address those um, challenges. Yeah, uh, I live uh, just outside of Birmingham in McCalla. And, uh, you know, when you're thinking about having kids, you look at the local school districts. Sure. And, um, you know, I hate to say it, but McCalla is not at the top. It's not uh, Homewood. It's not a Vestavia, you know, those kinds of things. And that, that, that comes into play when you're thinking about those uh, you know, settling in that area long term. It absolutely does. And um, it sounds like, you know, some, some families are better able than our others to, to make decisions like that, to actually move to a, to a better zip code um, and others are not. Um, and then if you think about families who have children with disabilities, that's an even, you know, an additional um, consideration in, in, in the school system itself, but also the special education programming and, you know, um, proximity to medical care if that's what's needed so yeah lots of things to consider there very fortunate to be here in Birmingham I feel like Birmingham is kind of the medical community of the south 
uh, there's just a lot of a lot of cool stuff coming out of UAB and and all the other hospitals and research facilities here. So it really is, and um, that is great. But we know that we have 67 counties in our state and lots and t- tiny little cities and municipalities. And so I think that um, one of the things that I learned when I transitioned from Children's of Alabama to actually I, I moved to Montgomery and worked for Children's Rehabilitation Service, which. Um, I suspect that your listeners and and viewers today may be aware of Children's Rehabilitation Service, or CRS. It's one of the programs within the umbrella agency, Alabama Department of Rehabilitation Services. And so we know that that program, the the, the state agency houses services for people with disabilities from, from birth to old age, really. And so they house both the state's early intervention program as well as CRS and I actually um, transitioned from direct patient care here at Children's of Alabama down to Montgomery and started to work in the state office there got more involved in in policy work then and one of the things that really struck me the well many things but one of the things that quickly struck me is how different it is uh, when you start to get out of the mecca of Birmingham and yeah. the mecca of a children's hospital, you know the only freestanding children's hospital here in in Alabama, and so to then make these visits all around the state to these local community-based offices and talk to people where they are versus where they've had to travel from, you know, and come see me in Birmingham, um, it was incredibly impactful and really made me understand even more so why public health and broader systems and policy level changes are important so that no matter where you live, you have access to the high quality services that anyone would want for themselves or their children. That's a big task to take on. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I imagine it will take quite a while. Oh, yes. Uh, but I applaud you for, for going ahead with it. Uh, well, full steam. Absolutely. Again, it's, you know, life is about partnerships and teams and collaboration. And um, I certainly learned that through my work in state government and how important that is. You, you really can't do things alone. There's, there's very little I. It's always a we. Um, Unless you make a mistake, and then it's usually an I. Yeah, they <laughs> right? point out to, then they start pointing fingers. Oh, yeah. no, right. um, and so uh, after getting your master's in public health, you went on uh, to Auburn. And so you just kept going with the education, and you really felt drawn to that. <laughs> yeah, that's what my parents said. Um, <laughs> no, I, um, I really, I, I mentioned earlier, I'm a lifelong learner, and I really wanted to get the higher level um, degree. I wasn't sure exactly why I wanted it, other than I knew that I wanted to continue to have opportunities to, and you can certainly be a leader and influence at all levels of an organization, and regardless of education, but I did want some of those higher level skills that I thought I could get through a public administration and public policy program. I wanted to influence policy at state and national levels, wanted to move um, perhaps more um, in an administrative kind of position. So. Right. That's that was um, I was really lucky to find a program that that could flex around with my uh, full time job at being in, as a state employee and um, learned so much there that um, that I'm really thankful that it was not an easy thing um, to do that. It meant other things that you didn't get to do that other people did. But. Um, it was super nice to when that was done. I'll put it that way. <laughs> yeah, for a few years you can't go out on Thursday night. And oh, you got to go to class and do your work ab- after you go to work. Right. Um, right. So that's quite a bit there. And then after UAB, if you could tell us a little bit about your transition, uh, or I mean after Auburn, if you could tell us a little bit about your transition to UAB. Sure. Um, so as I mentioned, I was a full-time state employee. Worked. Um, I was a. They, I think my title was special programs coordinator. So I had many little things, uh, but predominantly I was. Um, connecting dots with sort of our state's sort of maternal and child health programs, so some of the federal programs, and also um, occupational and physical therapy policy. So uh, that's what I was doing. That was my day job. Um, and also, we worked quite collaboratively with UAB in the School of Public Health. Uh, we really, um, they worked with us about needs assessment programs and program evaluation and helping us meet some of the, those needs because we didn't have the capacity in-house. Um, so it's actually interesting that I found myself doing the work that I do today because those were the kinds of things that we would um, have UAB partner with us to do. Um, and again, just because I had a wonderful mentor um, at the time, I, I, it, it worked out that as I completed my degree at Auburn, um, there was a faculty, junior faculty position open here at the School of Public Health. And one of my mentors, Dr. Beverly Mulvahill, who um, was just integral to, to helping me learn those, that pu- public health and the connection of, of public health to some of the more clinical and 
state programs, um, she was planning to retire. And they really wanted someone who could um, not fill her shoes, because that wouldn't be possible, but at least try to continue the efforts around um, connecting what students learn in classroom and mm -hmm. through books and lectures with actual real world practice. So public health practice, and in her case, she did a lot of work with children with disabilities or special health care needs, which is a little bit of a federal lingo there. Um, and so it just worked out that I was doing the job and had gotten the terminal degree, and I um, was recruited and applied and was so lucky to be selected. So I joined faculty. It's been 11 years now. Uh, it was kind of the universe conspires. I think it did. Yeah, <laughs> it was perfect timing. Right. Uh, so. And everything worked there. Right. Definitely uh, wasn't my plan, um, but it's been just an honor um, to, to have this opportunity to be here and, and work in, in a really supportive academic setting that recognizes the kind of work that I do, which is a little bit different um, from some of the traditional academic research. Uh, and I like that you um, are stressing <clears throat> Uh, taking what you're learning from the classroom and the books uh, to implementing it in real life, kind of from books to the streets, uh, I'll say in a little bit of the way. <clears throat> but I've heard somebody say before that you can be the smartest person in the world, read all the books that you want, but if you don't do anything with the knowledge, it doesn't help anybody. Uh, and you've you've kind of um, said the word pracademic before, and I've never heard of that word. <laughs> so, well, I can't claim that I coined that. I actually uh, found that in a blog, uh, but it is quite the right description for the kind of work that I do. So, you know, I never intended to, and never would have imagined myself in an academic setting. Um, I have always been a lifelong learner, so I guess I shouldn't be too surprised to, to find um, this, this, this happened to me or for me, I guess. Um, but this idea of being really grounded in the practice of public health um, and, and how that is, is being delivered, planned, implemented, and evaluated, but also then uh, marrying that with academic rigor. So some of the really strong um, research-oriented type um, strategies to, to support these practice-based programs to understand what they're doing, how are they doing it, how well are they doing it, are they doing the right things, are they doing things the right way, um, and really looking at not only how many people, but how well they're doing and delivering services to those many people. Um, so that's kind of the idea of, of a pracademic is that you, um, you know, it's one thing to, to do a lot of research and we certainly need it. We're in a, just a, a research mecca here at UAB, but really translating that out into the field and whatever field that is for you, for me, it's, it's public health, um, especially in disability and early childhood settings. Um, but taking the, um, this, as I mentioned, the ability to support programs in much the same way that UAB supported when I worked in state government. So, um, And it, I imagine it's kind of like a cycle there where you have uh, the learning and the theory and the data, and then you also have to go and implement it. And then you have to kind of take a step back and you have to come back and analyze more data of how that's going and constantly refining and getting better. I feel like a lot of people uh, may just keep going forward without taking a step back or, or you know, stepping back a little bit and analyzing, hey, do we tweak this a little bit? We'll get better results. Uh, to, so to have that support there uh, in what you do helps a lot of programs get better over the years. Sure. I think you're absolutely right. And um, I would say that that's something that I've seen a change in attitude about over the 11 years that I've been on this side of things and, um, as opposed to the direct service world or, or direct policy and program planning kind of jobs is that um, I think folks recognize the importance of, of really stepping back and um, thinking about assessing needs and understanding what people really need versus just assuming you know. And then going from that to designing and implementing programs but closing that loop back with evaluation. So um, oftentimes early on in, in, in my career, um, those things would be add-ons, tack-ons. People really didn't want to spend money to do those things, didn't always see the value, felt like that any monies or time that you devoted to those kinds of activities were time and monies that could have been devoted towards delict direct service delivery. And um, I, I certainly understand that point. But as the world has changed, um, there's this recognition that we need to be accountable, and not just for dollars, but to people. We need to be accountable to stakeholders, whether it's the person who comes through the door and receives a, a direct medical or health care service, whether it's um, public health systems that are put in place, 
folks who are influenced directly or indirectly by policies, we, we owe them to be sure that we're closing that loop and understanding how well those how well they work overall and critically back to that idea of, of equity and disparity how are there certain groups for whom things aren't working as well and without asking these questions and supporting anyone who's providing a service or developing a policy without you know having that piece and, and having data we want to make we want to empower folks to make data driven decisions not just on the gut, but the gut gut's feeling. important. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, the gut's great, but um, we definitely need to be able to ask those questions so that we hold um, ev- folks accountable. I imagine in the past it kind of felt like an audit. You know, if you're talking about these, you know, evaluations and, and kind of the feeling that maybe programs or people get, like, oh, we're going to get evaluated. Is that like an audit, the IRS kind of audit, and kind of stand backish a little bit? Yes, yes, and also um, sometimes when you know what we we want to make sure that we're not just asking the people that deliver the services or make the policies if things are going well, Mm. right? So um, that's another piece of it is when you begin to ask other individuals, people who might be consumers or, or, you know, recipients of services uh, who are uh, directly influenced by policies and programs and systems, well, uh, early on people, and even still, if you're not real careful, people can feel like that maybe if they they can't say something bad because they might lose it, mm-hmm. you know, or and so that's a, a really another point is that it's not an audit or trying to figure out what you're doing wrong, but also identifying what you're doing right. Um, there's so many right things. And so how can we recognize those and scale those up, expand them? And if you do find areas of improvement, great. That's that's absolutely what we want to be doing. We all want to have the best possible systems of care. It's kind of like focus on your skills uh, and get people around you on your team that have the skills that you lack, uh, but focus on those skills and, and heighten those up a little bit. Absolutely. Um, I would like to ask a follow-up question about getting feedback. Um, now, a lot of the, it may be talking with programs and getting input from the actual program and the, uh, the themselves, but if you're getting feedback from the consumers, is that sometimes tricky? It absolutely can be tricky, um, and especially, so I, I sit in an academic university, and I think I'm a pretty decently cool kind of person. I mean, I don't know. Says I think you're pretty cool. <laughs> so, but people don't know that, and so when you when you see UAB come calling, uh, not in or any academic setting, um, that can be a little frightening for some folks, and uh, so we may or may not have the connections directly with people who, who receive services or, or participate in programs. So it's super important to, to get that viewpoint. Um, you absolutely have to do it. It's, it's just critical um, to, we use the word triangulate, which is just a, a fancy little way to say that we want to hear from multiple perspectives. It's mm. not just hearing from one group. So directly th- speaking about consumer perspectives, it's, it's very important to work with um, trusted partners, people who do have access to um, the group that you're trying to hear from. And um, those nice warm handoffs and assistance with recruiting people to participate in evaluation strategies or, or needs assessment strategies is absolutely critical. Um, that's something that we struggle with a little bit uh, for our quarterly reports is getting feedback um, from our audience. And it's like, I'll put up a survey and be like, hey guys, can you please do it? I'll get like two people. <laughs> you know, I'm like, guys, I need this sure. data for our uh, sure. you know, our reports. And so that's always been a struggle for us. And I imagine it's, it's kind of tough um, you know, to get that feedback in a lot of different ways in a lot of different programs there. Right. I think that um, a survey is certainly a, a fast way to go about it, but um, I don't know about you, but I, I don't always take the surveys either. I don't either. either. I don't know why either. I asked the audience to do it. Well, yeah. If I won't do it myself or other programs. Yeah. It's, it's certainly one way to go about things. Um, and if you kind of have a more of a captive audience, that's great. But there are other strategies as well. You can um, actually do structured interviews with individuals. You can have focus groups or listening sessions where you bring people together in a room or and these days it's around a Zoom. Yeah. Um, but uh, to actually ask their their thoughts. And so, you know, those efforts are, um, it's, it is an effort. And definitely if you're going to be talking directly to consumers, there has to be some things in place so that they understand that, that they're not being forced or coerced to participate in this and that it won't impact anything to do with their services, that you really are trying to um, understand how well things are working and, and how, how things can be improved. And uh, we always, if possible, want to make sure that those folks are compensated for their time. I mean, you and I are sitting here today doing something and somebody's paying us, but 
um, you know, folks that volunteer, right, to, to participate, they have an expertise that they're sharing, and so they should be appropriately compensated. I agree with that, um, and I feel like that's kind of the unpaid intern. I don't believe in unpaid <laughs> interns. <laughs> right, uh, right. I feel like they should be compensated there. Um, I'd like to take a little bit of a step back, but what drew you to start working in disability? Was there a connection there, or what? Gosh, um, well, that's, a, I guess, an interesting question. I, I've thought about that, and, and the only thing that I really, it's, it's interesting that I was interested mostly in disability with children, but um, I did, my mom had some serious health issues growing up, and some of my earliest memories are either of visiting her in the hospital or staying with grandparents, relatives, friends because she was in the hospital. And so I wouldn't have known the word disability at the time, but I always lived in that um, understanding. And it's, it's funny that uh, sometimes I, I remember in when I would work weekends at Children's of Alabama and I, there was this feeling of the, the quietness of a hospital on a weekend. And, the, and certainly um, as my mom over the years in and out of hospitals and staying with her and hospitals in the middle of the night. And so that was very direct care, um, but she did certainly have a level of disability and recognizing how um, how that impacted her, how that impacted us as a family, um, the things that I learned, the ways that I saw she, she was treated by other individuals, and I, I really think um, that that's probably what drew it. I'm not sure exactly the, the connection for children with disabilities other than that I knew I always wanted to work with children. Yeah, uh, so there was a personal connection there at a young age and you kind of were drawn subconsciously in that direction um, through your experience. Uh, and I, right. think, I think that's very, um, I think the, the people around you and the people that you serve are very fortunate that you have that grounding, um, you know, to better serve them. Well, you're right, I did have the personal connection, but even if you don't, you can always learn. Um, you know, I'm not, not the parent of a child with a disability. Um, however, I really, if you, if you listen and you learn, you can, you're, you're never going to have that same experience. But um, I learned so much about family engagement. And, you know, I thought that I was good when I was in direct care about asking parents about their experiences. But I really learned it when I moved into state government. And I worked again with, with CRS and um, Family Voices of Alabama, Susan Colburn, another mentor of mine who really, um, CRS believes very strongly in family engagement. Um, maternal and child health programs really support that. Of You have to understand those experiences. So um, I would definitely say that just because you don't have that direct lived experience, it doesn't mean that you can't learn as long as you partner with people and truly listen um, to those perspectives. Mm, I think the listening there is really key too. And mm -hmm. you have to have empathy there for right. uh, that individual. You can't think that you're the, the, the expert in the room and the only expert in the room. Oh, they'll tell you you're not pretty quick. <laughs> <laughs> You'll be learning pretty quick. Um, so we've talked about it a little bit, uh, program evaluation, but I'd, I'd like to kind of define it for anyone that's unfamiliar. So what is program evaluation? Right. Well, program evaluation is, is really just that. It's the idea of a program. It might be a, a specific service or it could be something really large like an organization, um, but it could also be a very small program like a car seat installation program, right? And so what you're doing is evaluating in, in multiple ways. Um, I don't want to, you didn't ask me here to teach you a class, but uh, you often think about the, the processes that go on in a program. So like, how do we hire staff and how do we, you know, what are we delivering? So they're not really about the benefits to, to people who participate in the program, but more about what staff are doing. So developing materials and, you know, planning training. So those kinds of processes that usually result in numbers. How many people did you um, train and how many brochures did you send out? That, that kind of thing. Those are process kind of questions. And then the other side, which is probably, um, it's easier to do that process, right? It's a whole lot easier to count trainings. But the other side is, is the so what, so the outcome part of evaluation. So because you did those things, what did it mean for people? And so that's the other part of it, is being able to ask questions around um, the impact. Mm -hmm. um, so really the whole reason why you decided you wanted to do this particular program, right? So are you doing it? And how can you improve it? Yeah, um, and I love the data there. I, I feel like um, I've heard I've heard whatever you measure will increase in a positive way, or you'll figure out that. Uh, so you have to have that data, and you're kind of going in and helping these programs uh, see their own data, uh, like hey, and kind of analyze it for mm -hmm. them, uh, you know, and help them through that process. Um, now you mentioned that sometimes you'll go in and, and you'll evaluate 
like the hiring process. When you evaluate a program, are you doing a bunch of those smaller evaluations? Well, um, really, if you think about evaluation, I think some folks might um, think that it only happens at the end or at a, at a certain point. And really, evaluation happens all throughout the life of a program. I mean, certainly there are often certain time points, perhaps annually, that you might really take a, a, a deeper dive look. But evaluation happens all along. And I think one of the key things is to, when you work with programs, you have to first determine what are they interested in? What are they trying to do? And how would they know if they were successful? So mm -hmm. understanding, first of all, what is their vision? What is their mission? You know, what, what, are, what are their values? What, what are they actually doing? Um, and then aligning questions and strategies with that. So, you know, if they're trying to have people in place, uh, train staff so that they can go out and, and provide, you know, evidence-based programming for, for children, whatever it might be, um, those might be certain evaluation questions. So those processes that way. Mm -hmm. um, and I just, I definitely wanted to hit one thing because, you know, I'm getting a little old here and I might forget it if I don't say it now. When you talked about data and, and working with with programs on their data. Um, I think sometimes people hear data and they think number. And I really wanna highlight that um, it's not always just numbers. I, mean, I think of numbers when I think data. Yeah, of course. And and it, that's the easier thing to do, right? And numbers are, people really believe those numbers and you can crunch a number and you can give people percentages. And so um, that that's really great. And, and I think that that kind of information is what we think of uh, first and foremost, and um, sometimes we worry that, gosh, if you if you can't measure it that way, then it's not important, mm -hmm. or if it's hard to get it, we just won't do it. But uh, there's such rich information. Numbers rarely stand alone. I mean, numbers are important. We need them, but you also need that that richness and, and depth of how people experience a number. So, as I mentioned, talking to people about their experiences, um, talking to people who directly receive services. Services. So I mentioned interviewing and, um, you know, having listening sessions and focus groups, those kinds of info that those produce data as well. And there are um, methods to to evaluate that. And so data is a much broader concept than just a number. It is harder. I imagine it's harder to, um, you know, to get that data and then analyze it because if you're not in the room with the you know you're interviewing someone about their experience how do you quantify that or tell somebody about that oh wow you can come take a class yeah. <laughs> no i'm just kidding um usually it has to do with um taking really super notes mm -hmm. or in some cases recording and having a you'll, you'll actually have a transcript of that interview and you can actually use uh, their software to do it but you can do it by hand with really coding you're looking for themes um, you want to talk to more than one person, so um, you're you're not really trying to be generalizable in the same way that you might think about with data when people say, well, what's your sample size? Well, we're not talking about that. We're really just wanting to make sure that we explore different perspectives and use this, this coding to identify themes hmm. um, in these experiences. I like the themes there. We're asking for feedback on our website right now, and I'm talking with the guy that's building it. He's like, we're looking for, you know, we want five people to say this, and then we have to make that change there. <laughs> oh, wow. Okay. Yeah, so that's Pretty so cool. it's really funny then you said a, a, a numbers based sort of quantifiable um, idea for your more qualitative. I'll, I'll throw the five out, but he was like, we have to have more than one person because there's a lot sure. of time where I'm like, I think that it should be looking like this. Sure. And he's like, I'm done listening to you. You need to ask people for their feedback before I start making these changes. Absolutely. Uh -huh. well, but that's a really good point. I mean, we, um, if you do your own thing and you kind of think you know what you know, but if you aren't asking for that broader perspective, um, and it's the reason why when we do program evaluation, we almost always um, if, if, if the time allows and the, and the um, opportunity is there, we do what we call a mixed methods evaluation. So not to get too far in the academic land, but um, again, connecting practice and academics, right? Is um, these mixed methods, we, we combine strategies so that we're getting those numbers kinds of, of pieces of information. And sometimes those numbers already exist because programs usually collect that kind of information. But occasionally we'll need to collect more. So we do those numbers based, but we always do the other side, which we call qualitative um, methods. And so those are those ideas of talking to people. So words. So really it's numbers and words at the end of the day. I like uh, talking to people. So I'll stick with that one. Um, now uh, in the headline for today, evaluating the effectiveness of programs 
um, providing service to people with disabilities, the word effectiveness there, and I feel like that has to be defined for each program, but going through that process of defining effectiveness has got to be a struggle. It's kind of the starting point there. It absolutely is. Effectiveness means something different for, um, for, for each individual, really. Um, and so that is, there's a lot of ways to be effective. Sometimes people say, well, it's a cost-effective program or it's bringing about a change that you that you had. Some people think it's about satisfaction and it's probably a combination of all of those things, but you're absolutely right defining what effectiveness means. And I think I said a little bit ago about one of the first things I do when I work with new programs is, you know, what does success look like for you? Mm -hmm. And how would you know it? And then we can start thinking about how to measure it. Mm -hmm. Um, I feel like I need your coaching after we're, we're done here with Alabama care. <laughs> so, <'cause laughs> I, right. I would love to go through this process for us. <laughs> Let's get lunch. Yeah, exactly. Um, so what would an example process look like start to finish if there was a program out there that was interested in, in contracting your services? Sure, sure. So um, I sit here at UAB, but I am the director of the Applied Evaluation and Assessment Collaborative, which is a big old um, long title there. We call it AEAC for short. So uh, the, the big word there is applied. So we are in a research university, but we definitely want our work to be applied within these programs. And the other big word is collaborative. So we definitely want to work together. We're, we, we are often external to the program, but that doesn't mean that we don't want to collaborate. And actually, that's really the only way we work is in collaboration. So um, you know, there's that entity that, that we can work with. We work with state agencies, other regional organizations, nonprofit, really across the board, uh, we work with folks. and. Um, that initial the process starts with an interview, much like this one. Mm -hmm. um, set up some time to talk about what are the goals, why, why are, they, are they interested in an evaluation, um, looking at time frame, um, do they have an audience in mind, is this something they want to make a public kind of thing, or is it really more internal use um, for quality improvement, or those kinds of things. So really understanding the purpose of an evaluation is really important, purpose and audience. So we start there and then move into those questions around what, what does success look like and you know, who do you interact with. We want to definitely align those mixed methods, like I said, towards evaluate, evaluations or answering questions. So you have to identify what those questions are and then think through your methods. So we're, we're going to want to talk to your partner agencies. We're going to want to talk to people who interact because we're going to want to talk to you and your staff. And then we would also definitely want to talk with people who receive services or participate in the program. So those things happen. Um, once everybody agrees that this is what we want to do, then, then the fun starts. Yeah. <laughs> uh, the process of gathering information, then analyzing it. Um, and really critically important for evaluation is not just to I always tell my students, and maybe I shouldn't say this in a live show, but I always say, don't vomit numbers at people. Don't vomit charts back at folks, because you know we don't want people to have to work to understand what you're saying. So if you're going to use information and data, you need to tell people what it means. So in any way, you know, I haven't done my job, we haven't done our job in this evaluation team, if the agency doesn't own its own information. They have to be able to understand what was found, what it means, so they can do something with it. You don't want to just evaluate to evaluate, so you check a box. There should be a purpose. So that's kind of a closing step, or, or perhaps going into the next cycle, is making sure that as an evaluator, you explain what was found, and, and based on those, you can come up with recommendations that might um, that, that can be put into play. So that last piece, to me, is tying the bow on um, delivering a product that that really is someone else's. It, it, again, just like in the days of talking about the direct service, it doesn't matter if children could be successful in a therapy gym if they can't be successful at home. And the same way here, the bookend, this part of my career, doesn't matter if I can talk about someone's program and talk about their data and what it means and their evaluation. If they can't, it was a waste. Mm. So again, some coaching. Yeah, some coaching there to make sure they understand whether it's a, an Excel spreadsheet or what, what, what the data you're gathering means, even if it's not numbers there. Mm -hmm. Now, you mentioned there's a team. How many people are on your team? Oh, gosh. Um, I guess it depends on how you define team. <laughs> but there are about five of us that, that work in sort of one arena and four in another one. So um, we are we are uh, tiny but mighty, but we certainly have um, many partners that we ha have in the community and work with nonprofit organizations, and especially in the disability world, we've, we've worked with um, organizations that, that 
with an ad, advocacy group sometimes. Again, especially if we're trying to speak to, to children, to families, to people with disabilities, um, it's so important to, to partner and, and to support. As I mentioned, we, you don't want to always ask that people have missions and they do things out of the goodness of their heart. But if possible, when we partner with those groups, we want to be able to support them monetarily for the, their time and expertise. Mm. Um, now, it seems like quite the process when you start, you know, someone calls you and says, hey, we'd like to be evaluated. You sit down with them and you go through the entire process. What's the time frame look like? Right. Well, um, you know, there certainly are rapid cycle. I mean, there's, you could do something. Some people think, oh, gosh, we're going to be in evaluation for five years. But remember, I told you that evaluation happens all throughout the life of programs. So often you'll come up with a time frame of, hey, we want to do something. We have this grant that we're going to write or we're going to um, have a board meeting and, and in six months we'd like to tell them something about or oftentimes people will say hey we're going to do a little pilot project we're going to do something in two places and we want to learn from that and then make decisions about you know, do we need to change it do we need to um, not do it at all or do we need to scale it up as quick as we can so i guess the time frame is is just as de it varies just as much as the program yeah it's um, dependent on what they want mm -hmm. what kind of evaluation they absolutely. want so it could be you know a couple of weeks could be a couple of months maybe a year sure you've done pro uh, evaluations that have lasted longer than a year i i have um i have done projects and oftentimes people will come to us it's one thing to come in on the front end so someone has a new program or a new grant and they say hey will you work with us from the start and let's come up with an evaluation plan and we'll evaluate all along and that's one way to go about it but also we are often approached by organizations that have been around a while and they say hey we've never really had a program evaluation will you help us and oftentimes we're looking back so they're uh, they may have say hey let's look at the last two years of our information so we'll have that opportunity to use data they've already gathered and then spend some time gathering some new information, which usually has to do with what I mentioned earlier, those um, mixed methods side of the qualitative where we're really talking to people and listening sessions and interviews. Um, now, are there uh, evaluations that are uh, mandated by the government, whether that's federal or state? Uh, and would you say most of your clients come from those or are they ones where there is, doesn't need to be an evaluation, but they want it done? Right. It, it's probably a mix. Um, you're absolutely right that certainly um, most, well, every federal grant that I have ever seen uh, requires an evaluation component. Mm. Um, so that's just part of the um, part of it. That, well, they that, want to make sure their dollars are, go are actually working. Absolutely. Back to that accountability piece. And yeah. um, so that that is definitely a requirement. And so I think in the beginning, that was one of those things where evaluation was a checkbox. But over time, um, and certainly as evaluation science and, and really making it applicable um, has, has been helpful here, that individuals actually want to do it because they learn from it. Mm -hmm. So absolutely, there's that situation where someone um, needs to do that. There's also uh, many times, though, just probably just as often, where we'll have organizations that want to be accountable to the population they serve. They want to be accountable to, the, to a board or a group of stakeholders. And so they ask for those evaluation that usually those are the more time limited ones yeah. uh, versus an ongoing every year. Like, like if you have a grant, a five-year grant, it, that evaluation is ongoing. Annually, you probably have to write a report. So Quarterly it's a both and. and. Yeah. <laughs> Um, and what does the contact look like with the program that's being evaluated? Is it a daily? Is it a weekly? Are you there on campus? Or Right. Well, um, certainly before the times of COVID, we did lots of uh, direct meetings. Now there's lots of Zooms. Um, but it's also based on the design and, and the program itself. Usually in the beginning, we have lots more frequent contact. So we, it, you're right. It could absolutely be a weekly meeting um, with the program. And certainly then internally, our team has meetings in between. Um, but beyond that, uh, we like to have, once things are kind of rolling, um, monthly is about an average of what we do, um, certainly with updates and, and, and calls. So uh, you can't do this work. There, there's sort of different schools of thought about what it means to be an external evaluator and should you or should you not be engaged. So there's some idea that maybe to be a good evaluator, you have to be totally separate, stand out and... Um, that, that's just not the way we work here. Like not influence Right, at all. right, right. You definitely have to be, you know, objective. You can't get into and you have to remember, especially some of my work now, I'm interacting with places where I've worked and been. And I have to remember that's not my job anymore. And, you know, as an evaluator, you're not part of implementing a program or planning it. You really are about evaluating and providing information back to those folks who that is their job. 
Um, so, yeah, I think that we feel strongly that in order to uh, appropriately interpret those findings, so remember, it's not about just gathering a bunch of numbers and wowing people or, like I tell my students, vomit, <laughs> charts it, folks. We want it to be meaningful. So um, we have to, we feel strongly that engaging those programs is important to understanding what, what data mean against that context of service delivery and then um, ultimately thinking about recommendations. Uh, so it's very collaborative, hence the C in our name. Um, <laughs> when you're talking about, you know, uh, stepping back and not uh, influencing the process there and being objective. That's hard to do. Uh, I'm talking with some of my team members and it's like we need feedback, but you can't input what you think is right. Um, so it sounds like you guys constantly every day have to check yourself at the door, like leave my bias alone, you know, and just focus on what we're seeing in front of us. Sure, absolutely. I mean, we all have biases that they're, you know, sometimes good and sometimes bad and sometimes unknown, right? We unconscious bias. So um, it's the nice thing about working as a team that we can service checks and balances for one another. Um, it's the nice thing that um, with the luxury of having a, a couple of folks that work together, um, if someone's super knowledgeable, super ingrained in a particular program, we can say, hey, we're going to have you do a different role in this one. You're not going to do, be doing the interviews because it is really hard. And especially um, if you like to have conversation, we always want to, um, you definitely want to affirm what you've heard, but sometimes you participate in a conversation. And um, that's not exactly the way because, you know, you, you might be influencing what directing where the conversation is going. And so another reason for recording <coughs> these interviews that we might do in those more qualitative spaces, another reason for having transcription so that other folks who didn't do the interview can code that and look for those themes. So there are lots of ways that we try to make sure that we stay objective, even as we know a lot about the content. Um, I like that you guys have that team there where you can kind of check each other and work off of each other and keep, like you said, checks and balances there. Mm -hmm. um, now for a program that's thinking about uh, asking for an ev evaluation, what would the cost look like or the price? Right. So, um, well, we do things at all levels, right? Um, definitely this is a passion and UAB has been super supportive of we want to be not just outside a community, but in a community and not just coming in and trying to tell a community what's wrong with it or what it needs to do. Um, so we definitely believe in, in working in, in communities and together with communities because communities know best, right? And um, so all that to say, there's various levels. You can go from you know, the, the, the Cadillac version all the way into, I don't know what a, even a Pinto maybe, if they even make Pintos anymore. But um, in general, a rule of thumb, if it's a grant, if it were a grant project, a rule of thumb it, that, that you hear about is about 10%. 10%, maybe 15% of whatever that budget is, is an appropriate amount for a very comprehensive evaluation. Um, so if you really want to look not only at processes and counting numbers, but you really want to understand outcomes and you're going to do this rigorous uh, mixed methods that we've been talking about here for a while, those uh, run about 10 to 15% of a total budget. But an organization that isn't, that's coming with its own dollars usually will have an amount of money that their board would approve or that they feel they can. And so sometimes it's matching scope with an amount, but um, most always you can do something. You can always do something. Um, we don't have any kind of threshold or limit for which we wouldn't do the work. Um, and sometimes things are really rapid. They really might only want to look at some of those processes. So that's certainly a, a lower cost than one that would actually look at both process and outcome. I appreciate you giving us about a 10% figure there for the grants <clears throat> um, so that people listening or, or someone's you know interested in it, that they have a general figure that they know. Now, the 10% can add up to quite a bit. And, you know, the organizations may be saying, well, that's that's quite a bit. Why would I come out of pocket or why would I, you know, siphon off that percentage to have an evaluation? Right. And I think that um, it, it goes back to some conversation that we were touching on earlier about have, if you have an evaluation that's meaningful, so really working together, so not that external audit kind of idea, but answering questions that the organization cares about. And sometimes those are um, incredibly personal to the organization. And sometimes they're broader about accountability to stakeholders or accountability for funding. Um, we all do what we think is, or most of us hopefully, do what we think is right, and we think we know what that is. Um, but we definitely want to, to, most people don't get into the kind of work that we all do, especially if you're working with people with disabilities. You don't get into it just, just for the money <laughs> and just for the, the, the prestige, right? I mean, you, you care about, it's a topic that it's close to you for some reason or another. So I think part of it is 
making sure that that evaluation is meaningful, so working with evaluators that can help you get there, but also knowing that you are going to do something with it. it it's going to either affirm what you're doing and that you go, gosh, we're exactly in the right space. We need to do more of this. And you can feel confident talking to folks about it. And this is why you should invest in our organization. This is why you should give us this money. And look, we have this evaluation that, that shows all around the horn here that we're doing right. But it also is about quality improvement, right? So you also want to know where you can improve. Um, you may also want to know, well, we want to expand where are the right places, right? So. Anyway, I think that's why you'd want to do it. I mean, certainly there are folks who do it only because they were required. And I think those are few and far between these days. I think programs that are looking at doing it that may not have to do it, it you could kind of think of it as an investment into yourself or, you know, the company at that point. And if you mm -hmm. care about it, um, you know, you want to make sure that you're doing it properly and it's having the impact there. So it's almost like having a therapist for your business, <laughs> you know, to yeah. kind of coach you along and, 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 you know, show you where you could improve, yeah. you know, or, or some things there and talk through that. Yeah, really, um, I really like the idea of an investment. And it's an investment in your business. I'm going to um, steal that uh, if you don't mind, or I won't say steal, I'll borrow. Yeah. I'll borrow that. I think that's a nice way to put it is um, it's definitely an investment in your organization um, to know that you're not only doing uh, things right, but you're doing the right things. And those are not always the same thing. Mm -hmm. And then, as you said, <clears throat> the evaluation you can have, and it's fully explained, you understand that you can take to other people that are thinking about working with your program or maybe for future funding opportunities and say, this is, you know, we have the, the mm -hmm. data here to prove that this works. Yeah, I had a, a project that I worked with fairly recently that um, they had an external partner who, who would consider uh, making a donation, but they didn't, they wanted to assure that they were going to spend their money wisely and they didn't want to do it without some sort of information, some sort of evaluation. Um, so it was really important to this, this nonprofit organization to have an evaluation that um, even if it's, you know, it's not always the, the one and done, it, it, early, early, especially early projects that are in a pilot stage, you just have to show sometimes things, there's not a lot of evidence out there yet, but there's promising practices and promising programs. And so that's another reason why, and, and in that case, having an evaluation report conducted by an external group and um, it, it was really helpful for them to secure funding. Um, I'd like to ask uh, a little bit about some work that you're currently doing uh, through two programs that you've been working with. Uh, and if you could kind of give us an overview of those without getting too specific or sharing personal information, but uh, the CRS Early Intervention, you do some evaluation work with them. Right, right. So I mentioned the Alabama Department of Rehabilitation Services earlier, and two programs uh, within that umbrella agency are the Early Intervention, Alabama's Early Intervention System. So that's birth to three. Um, and then CRS, Children's Rehabilitation Service, and they serve uh, birth to 21. So both of those um, programs are um, known to, to me and certainly known to my team over time. And so we've been engaged with them for several years. Uh, we've done projects that uh, relate to needs assessment. So again, understanding what, what the needs are for the community, uh, for children and families with, with disabilities. Um, and also then thinking about evaluation. So in the early intervention world, um, you know, those services are provided in to, with families being that, that primary unit around the child and they're provided in a natural environment. And so really understanding the impact of those services uh, for those families. And you know, these are parents of young children and so there's lots of opportunities for them to learn about the needs that their child may have and, and how to communicate those and work with those professional health service providers you know, as really being part of that team. So we've been doing some, some really neat, neat work with them. Um, they're looking to uh, provide more and more opportunities to make sure that children are getting what they need, that they get identified with um, early on so that you can start providing services. And that, that might look like uh, the parents speaking up to their physician. Sure. Uh, uh, and then coaching them how to do that there. Absolutely. And recognizing when, when there are challenges and helping them understand, because with, with those young children, um, it's about what, what the parents' concerns are, and as, as it should be. And so helping them understand and recognize um, that and be equipped with the knowledge and the skills and the confidence, which is super important, to be able to meet those needs. Um, on the CRS side, uh, this is, they're doing such fabulous work around um, really the, across the age span of, of, of children and youth. And uh, they're doing some really neat work these days around 
Uh, we, we talk a lot about care coordination. I'm sure you've had others on this show that talk about care coordination. So those um, it could be parent, it could be a nurse, could be a social worker or other trained individual who, who really is a, a care partner in some ways and, and helping families and, and youth access services that they need. Um, and so that their care coordination program, doing some evaluation around that. Uh, also, you've probably had guests on your show talk about transition. So certainly for people with disabilities, as they begin to transition from, you know, the sometimes, school system. yeah, so sometimes it's based on age, right, mm -hmm. of transitioning from one type of program to another. And so um, transition, especially for, for CRS, that they have done a lot of work about um, sort of youth as they begin to transition out of pediatric care into more adult care and adult settings and you know school to perhaps college or workplace or beyond and so they've um, we've been working with them so it's one thing to ask about if people are satisfied with their transition and what does that tell it's great that's a great <laughs> starting point but um, the leadership at CRS has um, seen the need to go much deeper than that and set, they've actually set some targets around those and so to help measure those targets so we're doing a little bit deeper dive with them to understand not only are people satisfied, but why are they satisfied? What parts are they satisfied of transition? And what areas might be there for improvement? So I think you're hearing a theme here. Yeah. It, it, measurement and you know what's good and where do we need to improve? I love that you guys are working in the transition area as well. Uh, I feel like that's such a hot topic or it's a big transition. Um, and I think a lot of families kind of feel the stress of that, uh, especially sure. when the son or the daughter or family members in their early 20s. And, you know, this, <clears throat> the education system is is very nice in that it has structure there. Um, but kind of after that, it's, you know, how do we prep uh, these individuals for to continue that kind of structure in, in their job and college, whatever that sure. looks like. Uh, sure. So that's cool to be working in that transition. I hear it from a lot of parents, uh, you know, they'll call me at their son or daughter's 25, and they've been living at home for a few years. And things are going to the wall right now and everything's cracking up. Mm -hmm. And so that's a big time frame that I think uh, a lot of things could be done. And I'm glad that you're working in that space. Well, again, you know, if I wear the old old hats that I wore as being a therapist and then working um, in, in the state program, um, transition was something that was, it was a, a really important topic, um, not only for, for youth, I mean, certainly at those other earlier time points, but um, what, what we know is you can't wait to start, right? You can't be 25 and all of a sudden start thinking about it. You can't be 18 and think about it. And um, we know that transition is hard for anyone. And then when you overlay a disability, there are just other um, things around knowledge and knowing about your insurance and what it covers and what it doesn't cover and knowing about your particular needs. So um, that, that, that's a little bit of the implementator hat uh, that I'm, or implementer hat. Uh, but today as an evaluator, um, it's really fun to, to come at the other end of that and be able to help answer questions and, and provide some information to support improvement. Um, now, we've been talking about the ADRS, CRS, and early intervention. Um, there are other, a lot of other programs that you work with. Is there a, uh, another one that you'd like to highlight or speak about? Gosh, um, we've done just some, everything is so interesting to me. We've worked with the Alabama Department of Public Health. Um, a lot of work there in their maternal and child health programs. We've done work with the Alabama Department of Me uh, Mental Health. Um, it's been really some fantastic work that's been going on around pediatric um, access to telemental health services. That's a partnership with Children's Hospital here, and we've been doing evaluation um, f with that. Also, they've done some really fabulous things around infant and early childhood mental health, and that may you may feel like that that's, gosh, how do infants have mental health needs? But we know how important like early attachment and, and bonding and um, sort of social emotional development, that, that all, I'd, all I'd need to know I learned in kindergarten, right? But, yeah. So those social emotional skills and how important that is to um, for everyone to understand those those developmental needs and, and meeting those um, important. But another one that uh, I spend a lot of my time is the Alabama Department of Early Childhood Education. Um, have worked with them for, for several years. Um, they do some what we call evidence-based home visiting. So First Teacher is a home visiting program for parent prenatal families and all the way through the child's fifth birthday. And they also house um, the uh, um, um, voluntary preschool program mm -hmm. um, in, a, in our state. So uh, first class pre-K. So it's an award-winning high quality program. So both of those programs we've worked over time um, providing uh, evaluation services and um, and really looking at, at outcomes and in those programs. So 
a lot of really neat things in the early childhood care and education space. And those those programs continue to grow <clears throat> um, and serve a, a bigger audience. And I imagine, um, you know, from an organizational standpoint, uh, the, these evaluations help go to the local legislators or to the Congress when they have their legislative session down in Montgomery and say, hey, you know, this is really making a big difference for Alabamians. We need mm -hmm. to continue to support this. So it kind of gives them... Uh, you, you know, some ammo there. It, it really does. It absolutely supports. Um, some of those things are certainly required, but some of it is, be again, back to wanting to assure the accountability to, you know, federal and both of those programs that I mentioned that I ha they have other programs, certainly that they do, but those programs both have um, federal and state dollars as well as lots of community and business investment. So um, it's really important to assure that you're always um, at the forefront of, of doing, you know, providing good services and really not only just for today, but again, thinking beyond and really um, moving the needle for change in some of these really difficult areas and thinking about longer term health and, and educational outcome. Um, for evaluations, uh, I'm going to get kind of for us at Alabama Care, uh, we are a media company, broadcast company, kind of a news company just for disability in the state of Alabama. Um, what would an evaluation or what would like an effectiveness look like for us? Gosh, well, I would first turn that back to you. How would you know you were successful? I'm not the one being interviewed. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, seriously, though. I mean, uh -huh. Right. Absolutely. We would start with what are you, what are you gathering already? And you know, how would you know if you were, what would success look like? Um, but then I think we'd absolutely want to be counting some of your numbers. You mentioned some d uh, data before and you know, counting how many views you have and watches and comments and those kinds of things. But other than that, I, we'd, we'd also want to talk to people. So yeah. people who actually view your information and you know, brand recognition, people who don't view your information. Have they never heard of you? They don't care about it? You know, what is that? So uh, it could be really fun to design a project. Yeah, um, so Alabama Care Community, you might have Dr. Prescott giving you a call in the future <laughs> if, we can, if that's something we move forward with. Um, and for anybody uh, that doesn't know, we did it in our quarter report, uh, but the numbers we were talking about in the first quarter for 2021, uh, the audience, you guys, uh, we have watched the content for about 25,000 uh, minutes. So I appreciate you guys being engaged there and um, you know supporting uh, the content here. Um, I'd like to ask uh, if you were speaking with someone that was maybe in high school or college and thinking about getting into the space, the industry, what would you kind of say to them, uh, say to them or recommend? Wow. Um, yes. I think that um, you heard from a while ago, my path was not exactly the path that I planned. And so I think that'd be one of the first things is that, um, you know, sometimes things happen to you while you're planning and you end up really where you should be. Anyway. All, all along, right? <laughs> so that's okay. About, and I think the, the first advice is to be open, that there are a lot of ways to, um, to, to meet your goals. And for me, um, I think early on, I thought that there was just one way and I was going to do this one thing for the rest of my life. And I have found that um, the, the really neat thing about whether it's direct care and occupational therapy and, and, or systems policy work and public health is that there are a lot of ways. So you can be interested in something for a while and then you can move into another space. So um, those are, I guess, bigger, broader uh, nuggets, uh, but more uh, on the ground kind of thing. Um, I would say that uh, take every opportunity you can to ask people about. And, and most folks, uh, one, some advice that I received early on is that people will often be happy to talk about themselves. Mm. So if you have an interest, ask folks, ask people. Most you, They might not be willing to give you an internship or they can't or you're not applying for a job or a program, but they're gonna tell you about it. So hearing people's stories is really important, um, having those opportunities. Um, I think that you, know, you can, you don't have to be an either or. My path was direct care first. I got interested in, in, in that kind of direct uh, programming and then found public health later. Um, some folks go the other way. We have people who are in public health and then get interested in more clinical. And then some people do it all at the same time. So there's no one way. We have many programs where people are getting a nursing degree and a public health degree at the same time. So I think those skills can be, you can go one way and then the next, or you can do it in a, in a, at the same time and simultaneous. And so um, there, public health especially is a really broad field. I mean, you, you can do things around 
epidemiology and understanding disease outbreak, which is super popular these days, yeah, obviously. Yeah, I, I imagine the enrollment went up. Oh, gosh, ex exponentially uh, amazing. Um, but you can also care about, you know, environmental issues and clean water and exposure to chemicals. Or you can do things like I do, which is a little bit more systems work. Um, we think about being a jack of all trades. It's like, why public health? And I'm like, why not? Because everything is public health. Um, if we can in, think about those higher level population kind of um, interventions, then we can really make a difference for individuals. So I love it when we have physicians who come through our program and who are learning and getting an MPH. I think that, wow, what an amazing thing to be trying to get an MD and an MPH at the same time. But uh, I think that makes them better. And I know that I am better for having both of these uh, backgrounds, I'm better at what I do and um, so, yeah, I would recommend uh, don't don't close yourself off. Yeah, I, I like that you say your interest changed there because even though you may be an occup occupational therapist uh, for the next few years, doesn't mean you can't do something or, or you want to do something. So you don't have to go into something thinking this is what you're going to do for the rest of your life. No, absolutely not. And um, I'm, I'm lucky to have an opportunity to teach um, occupational therapy students uh, here on campus as well. So in the School of Health Professions. And so those are um, by and large doctoral students. So they were actually practicing occupational therapists already and to expose them to some of these concepts around evaluation and systems and public health is incredibly rewarding because it's not some of the things that they're learning in their clinical classwork. And, and so those folks, they may not ever, they might, they might see themselves one day being in um, programs in public health or community, nonprofit, and thinking about how to include people with disabilities in those programs, but they might not. They may stay in clinical work, but I, I feel like that having that additional training for them and exposure will um, help them I include people with disabilities more, uh, maybe be involved in some advocacy and policy work, and, and just being aware that there's life outside your clinic. Mm -hmm. Very cool. Um, well, as we kind of come to the end of our broadcast today, um, is there anything that we haven't talked about that you think the audience would benefit from hearing? Wow, I, I guess um, that we probably talked about it, but I, I just definitely want to highlight how important it is. I know we're speaking specifically about disability today um, and in any of the programs that I work with, but especially with disability, it's so important to um, hear the voice of people who actually receive a service you know and it's not people aren't doing you a favor by asking your opinion um, you need to that you know best you're the person who's receiving so um, you are helping a service or a program better itself by participating so um, you know I think look, being looking for opportunities asking for input there are so many um, wonderful advocacy organizations um, and I think there are programs that really want to help tell their story. So um, I would definitely make sure that if you're the parent of a child or a youth or even an adult with, with a disability, or if you yourself are that, um, you have a powerful role to play um, mm. in making things better in our, in our world. So definitely. So stand up. Stand up. Make your voice heard. And, and make your voice um, heard, yeah. You know, we, we t I tell our students all the time that, Anybody can stand on a corner with a megaphone, you know, as long as you have the megaphone, right? Yeah. Um, but having data to go along with that is incredible. I mean, you can't, you, if you have data to go along with the stories, it's important. And so I think your listeners are part of um, the advocacy process, but they're also for the, for organizations who are looking to gather data, they are sources. Mm -hmm. So um, it's just really important. You, you may think you're only one voice, one family, but um, it is a powerful role that can be played. Well, that was very powerful what you said. <laughs> so. right, with power, right? <laughs> um, well, on behalf of the Alabama Care community and the Alabama Care team, I'd like to thank you for spending the morning with us today and kind of introducing us to everything that you do here at UAB and for the community. Well, great. Well, I sure enjoyed uh, getting to spend some time with you and I enjoyed spending time with you all today in the in the listening verse. So thank you for your time. And uh, I'm delighted. I'd love to come chat again. Yeah, maybe we'll get another one set up. So, and you guys probably see the background. Uh, Dr. Prescott has this really cool studio here at UAB. It's like, you know, nobody else can use it. <laughs> Not Dr. Prescott's studio, <laughs> but uh, we borrowed it for the day. So. Uh, um, and at this point, we'll go ahead and say bye to our, our respective cameras and we will see you guys uh, next week.